Is this on? Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Holly Bradford Nelson, and I am the online programs manager for ECI. And we're going to be going through some live demos of the Extranet, uh, the Showcase program, and also the newly launched ePower Locator. Um, I think some of you are familiar with most of these programs. Um, we're going to start from the beginning and show you how to get access. If you have any questions along the way, feel free to ask them, or we can have some time at the end. I think I have a half an hour for all this. So, um, To get access to the Extranet, which is ePower Online, you can access it from the home page of Enron.net. And there's a login screen that you can click on from the first link up here that says Login. Right now, we have set up a training account. Um, the username is training account with a space between the two words and ePower as the password with the zero for the O. And that's <coughs> training account? Oh, from the first page? Training account is the username, and password is ePower with a zero for the O in power. <coughs> so is everyone logged on? I see some confused faces. <laughs> So once you log in, that'll take you to the home page of ePower Online. Whoa. And uh, basically, this microphone's getting away from me here. And basically, um, there's some core features of the site that we're going to go through really briefly. Um, I'm going to do a quick overview of everything that's on here. Um, there's the ePower Online update, which is the newsletter for our distribution <coughs> channel. This is updated on kind of an as-needed basis today, probably more regular schedules we move forward. Contains updates about the uh, network rollout, programs that we're launching for folks, um, different uh, toolkits that we're launching for marketing efforts for our distribution channel. Um, this is pulled together uh, as a team from the channel group and the marketing folks who pull this together. So that's one of the main features. We're going to be sending out our next newsletter on September 1st, so tomorrow. Um, if you go back to the home page. We've also got the online seminar center, which is part of the news and training section on the site. Here you can register for a MSHOW training session. Um, basically what we do is we ask, we will list our topics on the site, and you can enter your name and email address and register, actually you just, just scroll down a little bit more. That's as far as it goes. Okay, so you would click on this up here, and you would click the one that you'd want to attend. You have a question? Training space account. Yeah. It's a training space account, yeah. <laughs> Then E P zero W E R. Oh, try uh, right clicking on the home page area and do a refresh. Has everybody gone to this page here? Yeah. It didn't reload for you. Show hands who's on or who's 
Who's on? Yeah, who's on the site? Who's not You're on, on now. Okay. What's the username for your account? Training, Training account. Training account is a dummy account. One word? No. Two words. Two words. There's a space. Yeah. <laughs> and E-Power hmm? with a zero in place of an O. That's lowercase. Which one? Uh, this one? Just click on one of the links on the home page. Doesn't matter. Is it case sensitive? No. No case sensitive. Yay. You guys better be. <laughs> So is everyone pretty much connected to the home page? Okay, all right. Okay, so real quick, um, we've got, in the site, we've got some core features here. You've got user accounts where you can um, change your username and pa you can change your password and some of your user information, not within the training account though because it's a dummy account that obviously we can all use at once. So. Um, doesn't really apply there, but if once you get your individual account with your own email address as the username, that's where you can come in and change your password and do some maintenance on that information. Um, support information on how to contact us if there's problems with the site, training and news, marketing tools, and e-powered applications, which is the entry point to the interfaces for our products, um, namely uh, media transport. So we went through and showed you the ePower online update, which is just the newsletter for our distribution channel. Um, uh, both distribution and uh, you know, content providers are coming easier here? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, so they're going to see whatever newsletters, whether it's a content provider or distribution partner. It doesn't really make a difference, right? Not, not today. Um, one, of the, one of the goals, this is uh, one thing to point out is where we are at today with the creation of the site is uh, somewhat uh, limited infrastructure. And so what we're going to be moving towards is a more dynamic infrastructure which will allow us as people log in to provide targeted information for our customer types. So if a content provider logs in in the next phase of the site, they'll be able to see information that pertains to what they'd be interested in. Today, we kind of have this um, mostly, mostly uh, distribution channel focused content and um, that's kind of the way that we've, we've implemented it today. But moving forward, we'll have customized information for partner types and different people within those companies as well. So um, definitely a goal that we're, we're moving towards in the next phase of this. Um, we talked about the M Online Seminar Center, which is a, a way for our distribution channel to sign up for M shows given by uh, Jeff Capen and Bobby Robertson. Um, they can come online, they've already logged in, they can choose the date they want, it generates an automatic email to their account and it will um, <coughs> notify them of the information that they need to attend the actual M show. So this is actually, I mean, this is an important vehicle which we can use for you know, any type of customer, this online seminar center. If you all want to be trained for any type of customer, for media cab, for media transport, or things like that, via this, this tool, we can create you know, online seminars really easily and have the customer sign up for them. 
And basically, there's a way to tag who has signed up in a database so we can keep track of how many people have signed up, which ones they've signed up for. Today, we have one topic that they're, they're training everybody on. In the future, we would have several different topics, and so they could sign up for one or more. Um, but today, there's just one. Uh, we've also got a, a large variety of marketing tools. So if you click on field marketing, one of the latest ones that we recently launched is the Field Marketing Toolkit, which gives our distribution channel information on how to, on where we're going to be um, in the industry, attending shows and things like that. It gives them a pre PowerPoint presentation that they can customize with their own company information, with approved verbiage, logos, and explanations of our products, so that we've given them a tool that enables them to accurately describe what, what they would be selling through our products. Um, we also give them access to brochures, give them a little bit of information on who our um, alliances are so that they could include those names in some of their materials. So it's just a resource that aggregates information for these folks who are doing um, seminars out in the field, out in the industry. Um, go back to marketing tools here. And one of the things to point out is the way that this site works today is you click on a link here, it will give you a drop down of all of the contents within that category, then you can click on those sections to get to that information. So if we go to the online marketing toolkit, that contains advertising, online advertising information, we've got ad banners, logos, uh, usage guidelines for our logos, um, all of the stuff that they would need to do some online marketing campaigns for our products, work through with um, Marcom and the other folks who do the, who get our branding approved. Um, in the Partner Starter Kit, we have a whole bunch of information online for folks. A lot of this was contained in the ISP training kit that we took out to some of the original road shows for customers. And we put it all online. We've got the, uh, everything from the welcome letter to streaming videos uh, showing how our products work from the FYNet CDs that we've passed out as well. So we've kind of contained all of this online so as a place to put people to, to navigate to to get educated on some of our basic information about the company and our products. Um, and the only one we haven't shown is the telemarketing toolkit which provides scripts, downloadable scripts that can be customized with the company's information as they need to put it in to the scripts for different um, types of telemarketing activities, inbound and outbound, um, and different types of customers. And also information on how to, um, how, how to market our products in these efforts. So it's a lot of proactive um, efforts on the part of the marketing people to get our products positioned correctly and put it online so it makes it easy for them to access it. Um, let's see, we'll go to the uh, user accounts just to show you how this works. Um, if you click on account admin, <laughs> it'll show you who is currently registered within the training account. Um, if this were a company such as Easy Street, for example, this would show the names of the folks that are registered under Easy Street and you can see who else within your own company is there and you can change your own information only. Um, the way we've set the site up today is that we have people designated as admins for their company. Those people can see everything and change everybody's information, meaning if somebody needs to be deleted from the group or something like that. So a little more administrative work. Um, yeah. So this is how an admin uh, designated access would be able to add a new person to the site. Bare minimum, we need their first and last name and email address. It generates an automatic email to that person's account saying, welcome to ePower Online. A few of you may have actually received some of these emails. Um, we're getting through the process of giving folks individual access to the site as opposed to using the training account login. Um, if you scroll down here just a tad. These are the types of roles that we've designated today. Um, again, we're going to be revisiting how the site is supported infrastructure-wise, and part of that will be refining how this process works. Um, but today, we've got, you know, we can click if somebody has access to the products or not. They don't always see the products, which means this wouldn't show up. They uh, could be a company administrator, which means they have the right to delete and add new people. 
And then financial reporting um, to, see, to see and view it is basically the uh, functionality that we have today um, that would be available. It's not uh, part of the training account um, access. To you know, country cool to go in and set up their account, or would I set it up for them? We would need to set it up for them, okay. and then we would need an administrator's email, name, address, as much information as you can get from them, and then um, enter it into the system through our process, and then they would get an email that would then enable them to to add more people at their own company. So I need to email that information to you then and ask you to set that up. Yes. And at that point, when you set that up, it kicks an email to the customer. Saying here are your codes to get in. Yep. Okay. And then every other every other person in that organization after that can be added to the account via the administrator, that customer administrator. So we only have to add the first person. Did someone else have a question? I thought I saw. No. Um, let's see. We can go into e-powered applications. You may have seen some of these interfaces yesterday. Um, if you go to the media transport reservation. All of the uh, functions for creating a reservation, canceling a reservation, querying information on the network um, are there. And this is the access where you access this today. And for MediaCast, people who do the IP address management can go online and manage their IP addresses um, here. So if we go to. Uh, does anyone have any more questions about the extranet? I wanted to. What billing information would be um, basically you can view a bill, and you would be able to see what the the time, the time depending on the product, the time that they used it, the duration, um, usage, those types of how things on the bill. How much of it is there today? Um, not much. Not much. It's just a it's a manual transfer of the actual. Um, uh, server log files into this, and so it's it's not much there at all. What what the plan is to put Excel files in here for phase for the version one, and then link it directly into the billing system when they have that going. So it's pretty static today, and it's just based on the information that's displayed. The user reporting will this sooner or later be real time. Ultimately, yeah. yeah, not not in the version that we have up today. It's a posted file. <coughs> viewable. Basically, you can download it and view it. You can't change it or do anything with it. But moving forward into the next phase of the site, um, we will be looking at dynamic information. That's one of the big keys that we want to try to accomplish with the next version, is keeping everything as real time as we can. So at this point, this version is released, what are we looking at as far as the usage information? When it is first made available? What actual data items we're looking no, at? No, not specific data items, but how quickly will it be updated? Um, Once a month. month? Well, that, for MediaCast, the usage reports will be coming out of the billing and, and usage area weekly. Okay, that's what I thought. When that's weekly. up and running, yeah. yeah. Right well, now, no, they're, so they're so actually so going to be creating usage reports weekly, okay. and then it'll get faster once the software is actually implemented in December. But monthly for, for bills. <coughs> also might want to touch on the support center. Yeah, actually that's it. Basically the support center today just gives information on how to contact us. Um, we post some frequently asked questions about the site and the products online. Um, there's an email address and an 800 number you can call. And then if somebody has a question about a partner program, we have a separate email address for someone to inquire about uh, a program piece as opposed to a technical issue. Moving forward into the next phase of the site, we would be looking at trouble ticket entry, being able to submit a problem online, things like that, and hooking into the remedy system. So um, some of the functionality that we're looking at moving forward, not that we have today. Um, today it's pretty much contact us, but we're, we're getting there. Um, if you don't have any more questions about the extern, I'd like to show the uh, ePower locator tool. which you can access from nrun.net. It's under ePower Update. You guys see this link over here? It's ePower Update and it says use the ePower Locator. 
Basically what you can do, there's information on some of our uh, dist distributors and some quotes that they've made about our, our uh, products and working with us. You can click on here to access the tool itself, which will ask for some information. This is assuming that somebody's coming in from the internet site. They could be a potential distribu distributor, content provider, all different types of people because they're coming into the public site. So we're asking for them, it's a little bit of information from them to help us gather some leads and information about who they are. Um, if they're an end user, they could potentially be a distributor lead as well. So this will be contained in a database for folks who enter information in here and use the tool. <coughs> and you can search either by your physical street address or by your area code. It pre-fills the fields and you can just choose whichever one you want depending on the accuracy of your information. So once you do that, it comes up with the um, the distributor in closest to your area that would be able to potentially serve you with e-powered services. So it gives you their uh, website and a contact number. And then we you can, can go back and do various too. searches. Hmm? We can try New York. So it's the first iteration of a tool online that we'll be using to help people understand who they can contact to, to sign up with our services, who we're working with, um, as well as for us to gather leads um, for folks who are interested in these types of things. Moving forward, this engine will also be um, enabling some different types of um, market research and things like that. But for now, the first iteration of it is online for the, the uh, public site. Do you have any questions about this? Pretty straightforward. Okay. And then the next thing I wanted to go over was the showcase, which is off nrun.net slash mediacast. And this is the live demonstration of ePowered Mediacast. It's accessible from the web. And basically, the, the creation of this tool was made for our distribution channel to be able to give access to their customer base to come and see some of our content to get them excited about signing up for the availability of ePowered services through their ISP. Um, what I've found and what I've heard is that this is also becoming a, a tool used to demo our content for various different types of audiences. So um, one thing I would like to ask from this audience is to get information from you on what would be useful as a demo tool, um, the types of things. I know that the way that this one's been designed is for a, a particular audience and um, just getting any of that information, you could feel free to email me with it, any inputs you have, feedback, or just find me after this and let me know. And the username and password are both ePower4, no zero, just the regular word. So basically here today we have a collection of content at various speeds um, that you can click on and get a, get a demo uh, depending on your connectivity of the, the content. And for this audience, for this iteration, we've posted up a survey to get their feedback after they viewed the content to understand what their viewing experience was like. We're not e powered here. <laughs> PGD is the e I might take a minute to lose it. 
So those are the three main online programs we wanted to point out today. Does anyone have any questions about that? Any of those? Another last chance for the Serbian leader Slobodan Milosevic, another threat by NATO to attack if he doesn't deal. Dr. Jack Kevorkian goes on trial for murder. In this first trial of its kind, the doctor is his own lawyer. And we'll be adding some additional clips to the showcase as well as some various speeds to do some better showcasing of the difference um, <coughs> in the future. I think what we're, what we're looking at or talking about is creating a, another version of this for that purpose, um, or maybe just changing this one for that purpose. I've had a few conversations with people about using it as a demo tool and probably needing to reformat how this is displayed altogether. Um, but yes, definitely. And that's actually why I wanted to get any inputs you guys have on what you would need for a demo tool online. Um, that would be helpful. So if you don't have any more questions, there's a question. <laughs> That media transport, like, it's like go over that with, a, with someone or a customer. They, they always have one or two pretty good ideas about you know, what things they want. Where can we forward that, that kind of information? For media transport? Yeah. Um, would, that, would that be your department? Or? Probably be Jeanette. Back to Jeanette. To be able to help you with that. You specifically or someone in your group? Mm -hmm. Same way on, on media cast. Anytime, you know, customer as a feature request, you know, send it to me and, and we'll put it in the list for the next rev or so, if it makes sense. Yeah, that's a good point. If you're not, um, if this is being viewed from a non-e-powered connection, the buffer times for 200 and 400 will obviously be higher because it's coming off one of the Terrapop facilities that we have in, built in the, um, in the uh, internet um, pops. So if it's not e-powered, you might want to start at the 100 kilobit streams, which will work a lot better than the internet will. <clears throat> this is actually pretty good. You have sound for that? Yeah. Right. There's some congestion, though. You can see it's 400 kilobits well, isn't great yet. Economic cooperation between our two countries. Okay. Do you guys have any other questions? Thank you. It's the balance of the time for questions. Start off with the operations organization. Uh, customer service, desktop support, network operations center, the NOC is commonly referred to, technical support and field support. The uh, customer service organization is currently rolled into the network operations center. It is not yet a separate organization. We will very shortly be setting up a, a separate CSC or customer service center out in Houston. Take advantage of our uh, organizational and, and space out there. Desktop support was recently uh, rolled into operations, separated from the the enterprise part of the IT organization, which is also now part of operations as a core. Technical support and field support work in conjunction with the network operations center folks as well as customer service to provide higher level technical support as well as on-site uh, on hands-on support for the equipment that's out there. And the uh, field ops people who are here today are people you'll be working with quite a bit, I'm sure. And as I said, the enterprise network group, uh, which does uh, the email Lotus Notes, the uh, the common internal LAN type network connections, also doing the OSS and uh, all the billing type of support. And you'll be, uh, you'll be hearing a lot from them. Uh, kind of roll into some of, the, some of the things we do. We'll get into more detail on some of the monitoring and management, uh, as well as the uh, ticketing systems that we have here. We right now have a basic topology type monitoring system that rolls into the network using HP OpenView. It's an auto discovery type system. Rolled into that are more advanced tools like Seagate Nerve Center, which is a little more intelligent, 
give us a real view of what the network looks like as well as all the, uh, the systems that are on it using Sienna Wave Watcher for the uh, DWDM equipment that uh, some of you are probably very familiar with. Uh, Cisco Works 2000, of course, for the Cisco particulars. And uh, Micromuse Omnibus, which is a, a front-end integrator for the operations people. Primarily right now in the NOC, eventually we're going to roll it out to the field so everybody can look at how the network looks in a real-time fashion uh, centrally at the Network Operations Center and specifically at the different field sites. Of course, capacity planning is very important. We touched on that actually a few times in different presentations. You have a lot of different products and a lot of different customers competing for what is essentially a finite resource, which is network type resources. Bandwidth, of course, also server, process time, etc. In order to constantly be one step ahead of the use, you have to have a planning structure, and we currently do that in conjunction with a lot of the same tools that we're using here. Of course, the, uh, the output of all this, happy customers and money, which is what we're all here for. Uh, this is probably a little bit difficult to see. Uh, Linda has it. She'll be sending it out. This is kind of a, a topology of all those different systems I was talking about. For those of you who have been over to the NOC, we have a, a wall up there of video screens and we display some of, the, uh, some of the more common and informative tools that we have up there. The one in the lower corner here is the Omnibus tool that I was talking about. Very color intensive. Look up, heads up display one time. You see red, red's bad. Yellow, not good, but not quite as bad. Um, and green, you'll see when they're clear. Kind of a topological map of the United States right now since we are North America. Um, upper corner, of course, being New York. Upper corner, the other side being Portland. You get the idea. Green, again, good. Yellow means there's some problem underneath that. And using the tool, you can actually mouse click and drill down to see the individual sites. We love visitors over there. So if any of you haven't been there or haven't been there recently, please stop by. Uh, we'd be glad to give you a tour and go through all these tools in more detail. The, uh, the NOC folks themselves right now, the uh, customer service slash NOC center, uh, people sit in a dual tier type organization, six people on on site at any given time is the maximum we have capacity for now, which is why we're very interested in getting this distributed out with a secondary site out in Houston. The two sites will be working not as a backup and primary, as you some, some of you may have seen at previous organizations, but they'll actually be working together as one virtual call center and network operations center. So that if you're a customer calling in, you don't know whether you're talking to somebody in Houston or you're talking to somebody in Portland. It's all transparent. So you get the same level of service no matter who you get, and they can back each other up case of uh, power loss, God forbid, natural disaster, we'll never, uh, we'll never project it to the outside world. Escalations. This is more on the process side. A lot of times uh, people, people wonder what's happening when they, when they put in a call. Uh, I haven't heard from anybody in an hour. You guys still working on this? You guys take vacation? Anybody even in the knock today? Of course they are. What we have is an, an automated system that will inform the network operations center technicians when to escalate based on the priority or the severity of the problem. And these are based in levels. There's a managerial and a technical. The technical escalation is there to ensure that the right resources are applied to fixing the problem at the right time. The managerial escalations are there to make sure that the management chain is informed so that they can make sure that everything's happening as smoothly, that every resource that can be engaged is engaged to get the customer back up on the air as soon as possible. First level escalation. For priority one, which is something is down, something is not working, that's immediate escalation to the ship lead on site, as well as the pop managers, the field ops folks who are here today, and the lead technician in the network operations center. I'm sorry? That would come up red. Uh, the problem itself would come up red on the map. Yes, it would. Excuse me. Technical difficulty. It would come up on the map if something gets down. And again, an error, high error condition will come up as a yellow. Uh, second and third level, uh, knock managers informed after 30 minutes of a down condition. Again, technical support, which is an engineering level support, lower level engineering support, the gauge after half an hour as well. Third level, the uh, production support director, which is myself, as well as the, uh, the local field ops director, which is, which is uh, based on uh, region. Uh, and the engineer support. These are the people that work directly with the actual application and network engineers so they're very privy to, uh, to what's going on and how this stuff is really architected. And that's after one hour in an outage, and the lower priorities you see are based on different levels that we've set. 
pretty boring stuff unless you're actually into it, but I can go over levels with anybody who really wants to. The fourth and final level of escalation um, is to the VP of Operations, which is Lorraine Simmons, of course. And the engineers will continue to work with the vendors and also with the actual engineering, the <coughs> excuse me, product development folks, the actual network architects, and they will get the problem solved, whatever resources are needed to be engaged. Um, again, I said the final level escalation is the fourth level. Of course, if it's not fixed by then, we don't just stop working. We, uh, we do contact uh, other people as necessary. That's real short and sweet, hopefully. Uh, I would like to entertain any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Customer service. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell, tell us what your plans are to support a product specifically? If somebody's calling up and saying, yeah, my, my media cast is coming out right, I'm getting buffering or something. And, you right. know, or someone has a problem setting up an encoder or something like that. Are you going to be set up to support? Yeah, part of that is organizational, obviously, getting a separate organization in place. Uh, we are going to have a separate organization in Houston uh, once we get the facilities there. And they will have all the tools necessary not only to verify what the product is capable of doing, but also able to work with the customer in as much of a hands-on fashion as possible. They'll actually be able to replicate the customer's setup. For instance, they're having that buffering problem. They'll go to somewhere in our network and try to reproduce that problem. I'm sorry, did that... <coughs> Yeah, the only other question is, mm -hmm. you know, how will we find out when these things are available and when we can, you know, tell the customer it's okay to call? And well, the number won't change. Uh, right now, the, the 800 number, 267-7028, right now goes to the Network Operations Center. Once we get a separate customer service organization in place, it'll go there instead. We want to make it as seamless and transparent to the customers as possible. Uh, we can't keep a secret here anyway, so I'm sure you guys will find out about it. But, no, we'll be sure to let everybody know. Sorry. Yeah, that Kind of address my question, you know, a formal date as to when the desktop support would be transferred, but if there's really, if it's seamless, then, uh, you know. Yeah, I'm sorry, desktop support or the customer service? This is, well, I'm, I'm I guess I'm considering it the same thing. Okay. But, so, somebody who's having problems from the, the distribution partner side, mm -hmm. they're calling into this number, and currently it's going to you guys, and it will eventually be going to Houston? Correct. Okay. And the customer service center will handle both internal and external calls. So if somebody's having, like, that's why I wanted the clarification on desktop support. If somebody is having a problem with an internal application or an internal process, they'll call the same number, they'll get the same group of people, and they'll be directed as appropriate. Uh, contact me. Okay. Yeah. What about um, read-only uh, remote access for, you know, a lot of the operational? Is mm -hmm. that available? The actual raw data? Yeah, or just like in being able to see the, the graphs you know, and the, a lot of displays from the NOC mm -hmm. remotely. Several, uh, several uh, things that I'm thinking of here is, is that one is that some companies are like putting that out on extra nets. Some of that, you know, selected information. I don't think, and I'm, I'm looking especially like at above net, and they have a lot of that information out there. Yeah, a lot, um, part of that is a challenge in really boiling out what you really want customers or outside people to see. And there's almost always some kind of, uh, some kind of manual intervention there. Right now, we don't really have the trend analysis data to be able to do that. The, uh, working with Matt, of course, we do want to eventually make that available first to the, to the extranet and then eventually to, to the internet community at large. Kind of a, you, you don't want to get too much into detail for, for outside folks, for obvious reasons, for intelligence reasons, if nothing else. And uh, you really want to present it in a graphical format, kind of a weather report. If, you've ever, if you're aware of the internet weather site, it uh, gives you a general status on how things are looking at the moment without giving you a lot of detail. We want to make all that detail available, however, to everybody who's internal and needs to know that. And what about internal within the company? Like, I, I know one, one thing that I, that I would, access to mm -hmm. the uh, Wave Watcher so that I can check to see. One of the things that we're planning to do to shorten up the uh, visioning cycle for that is, is um, put, in a, put in a channel before a customer comes up and the, you know, once we get an order, so all those cards are already inserted in that route and then all that we have to do is just uh, do a final test and turn it over to the customer. 
then we'd have to have operations go back and insert the next channel. Mm -hmm. We'd have to order that channel, order the cards for it, insert it. And I'd like, I'd like to be able to kind of second check that. Uh, yeah, Is specifically with Wave Watcher right now, we're in an older version of it. Uh, the newer version is due out next month, and that has a little more liberal license requirements. We can actually give read-only access to people. So the uh, next challenge after that is being able to distribute that from the server side, because right now we're looking at it more from a network perspective. Everything is centered here in Portland. So you, we don't want people coming in and making multiple connections to a machine whose job it is is to monitor the network, because you actually impact performance by having number, a number of hits on it. We want to distribute that out to all the sites, so you just go to the local pop near you, you get all the same data. It's all available to you. You're just putting a little less stress on the network, and you're putting a lot less stress on the individual server that has to handle all those requests. The next version, Sienna, again, particularly, the next version after it's out in October, roll it out into a laboratory environment, and we should have it up uh, available to everybody on a read-only fashion by December. So um, get back to me if you don't hear anything. Um, but yeah, I'm more than happy to provide that. It's just a matter of architecting it so it, so it can handle that without impacting the actual performance monitoring. Everybody jump on me. Doug, you gave me a hard time earlier. You answered all my questions, Jim. I did? Yeah. Right. I'm impressed. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you. In channel development at Enron, and I think I know pretty much all of you here, and um, I look forward to meeting those who I don't know. But uh, what I wanted to do is spend not too much time. I have an hour, and I definitely don't need an entire hour, which you're excited about. Um, I'll just go through kind of the stuff that uh, we're working on as a team here and let you all know who's doing what and talk about some of the programs that we've in introduced and love to have this a dialogue and get your feedback on it and um, just kind of go from there, okay? So the quick agenda, what I'd wanted to talk about is, you know, an organization of folks uh, on the team. So you, the people in the field, know who to go to. Who do you call if there's a problem, right? And I think pretty much the people who are on my team are, are here for now. Review some of the media programs that we put in place, right? And also talk about a new program that we have with around encoding and acquisition partners that we can extend out to some of our content customers. And then spend some time on enterprise programs and to see how uh, we envision making sales into an enterprise and how the interactions with channel programs and sales and our partners would take place there. Um, that's a little bit further out. It's more of a projection than we're having to deal with now, but it's, a good, it's worthwhile going through. So basically, the organization is pretty simple. It's marketing and channel development. We have uh, a group that's going to be responsible for enterprise programs. That's working with the enterprise and getting our services sold into an enterprise. Um, content services are, are facilitating that with programs getting sold in the enterprise. So uh, content services like uh, for an enterprise wanting to host all their corporate training using MediaCast, or they wanted to use video conferencing, or they're wanting to um, uh, connect their e-commerce application to the EIN so that it works better. That's enterprise programs. That's Teresa Reedman. Teresa, raise your hand. Everybody, everybody see Teresa? That's Teresa Reedman, and she's responsible for that. If you have any enterprise questions around enterprise marketing or programs, Teresa, call her. She has a cell phone and everything like that. Um, media programs are programs we're going to put together for the media, media business. Obviously, those are you know, the biggest cast and transport customers right now. And it's mostly looking at how we support resellers of these services and their efforts to getting uh, media cast and transport customers. Um, that uh, position right now is going to be filled by uh, Lisa Hanna. Lisa Hanna um, is not here right now. She actually starts next week. Um, but she comes to us from Tektronix and with a media, media background um, and is really going to help out there. Then there's sort of this market development bucket. Market development is all about um, figuring out where do we go next. You know, where do we put network? Who do we connect to in that network? Who are our customers there? And they're sort of like, if we think of all of us as kind of like the infantry, they're sort of the early stage scouts that figure out what are the boot opportunities to go to. Go to. Should we go to Memphis or not? If we do, what are, the right, what are the right products to bring there? Who are the customers in Memphis that we'd want to be talking to, setting up some appointments for, with those customers? 
using a lot of the GIS tools, which I'll talk about in a second, to figure out you know, where customers are demographically and where we want to strategically, like around the world, where we want to build out our network to, and then launching markets once we're there, you know, telling, letting people know that we're about that. So there's a market development organization. Um, there's in the Americas. We have a person starting in uh, a couple weeks for that. There's a person in Europe who um, we have an offer to, and Asia Pacific is going to be a little bit further out, but that's also um, in the plan as well. And then from a, a, a technology program standpoint, we have two, tech, two groups of technology programs. One is online programs, and um, Holly Bradford Nelson, Holly, raise your hand again, is responsible for all of Enron's online programs, all, meaning Enron.net, which is our website, and ePower Online, which is the extranet. So anything that has to do with our, if you don't like our website or you love our website, call Holly. If you don't like the extranet or you love the extranet, call Holly as well. Um, and so she's driving all of that and is going to be doing a lot of really interesting things there where um, she's thinking about a lot of automation types of tools and really driving marketing automation on the website. So there's a lot of things there. Holly comes to us from Intel, by the way, where she built all their e-commerce uh, systems online. So she has a lot of good background there. And then GIS programs. GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. It's a way to take database information, a lot of information about addresses and demographics and things like that, and actually put them, plot them geographically on a map so we know exactly where that customer exists. What is the address of that customer and what sort of fiber did that, did that customer, what kind of internet connectivity does that customer have? Is it DSL, is it T1, is it DS3? And also know who's the CLEC who services that customer. We'll know where the banks are, the financial institutions with greater than 100 people are, where their physical address is so that we can order circuits into them. And we'll know, you know which cities have the highest concentrations of cardiac care centers so that when we want to do e-powered telemedicine, for example, we need to go to those cities. So Laura Benville, Laura, raise your hand, is responsible for our GIS programs. The first example of that GIS program that you saw was e-powered locator, a thing that, that Holly demonstrated that helps us find, helps customers find ISPs. So this is a customer-facing application, and it's an internal uh, application, and um, we're going to be building that stuff as well. So if you have any ideas around how to use that, how, you know, GIS stuff would be of help, you know, if you want to find customers faster, then call Laura. Everybody has a cell phone and everybody here is on email and all these guys, we all check email religiously. Okay. <clears throat> so the next thing we want to talk about is just media programs. Um, and this is some programs we put together specifically for media cast. We haven't done much with transport yet um, for some good reasons. But there are, uh, well, it's because there are fewer customer opportunities for transport. So, yeah. So you don't need, necessarily need a, it, it's a targeted list of customers for transport. So, but for media cast, there's a lot of cu potential customers out there. A lot of people think about webcasting out there, right? There's not only the ABC News of the world, but there are, you know, Joe's Bait Shop of the world, who might be interested in streaming. And it doesn't make sense for us to be calling on Joe's Bait Shop. We have what, five or six of us here who are actually doing media cast calls. So what we want to do is actually develop an indirect channel, a way where we can recruit um, folks who work for us, who represent us into, the, into these accounts, right? And we have three tiers right now of um, indirect channel for content providers, for media cast, right? And we did not, by the way, when we created these, it wasn't our waking up one morning and suddenly saying, you know, this is the way it has to be. We actually looked at what Cisco does. We looked at what some of our competition, like Interview, does. Um, and we looked at, we tried to build some programs that allowed, allowed companies to progress up the, up the line. And so the expectation is, is that there are partners of ours who would fit into one of these channels, right, and one of these, uh, one of these programs and not all of them, not the highest level. So just to talk about them, and I'll start from the lowest level up to the top, there's a referral program. A referral program is really simple. It's we sign them up to a real easy agreement and they refer deals to us, to our salespeople. So if I'm a media cast salesperson and I get somebody signed up as a referral, what happens is, is that they'll refer a deal to me. If I close that deal, then they're entitled to a percentage of the revenue from that. 
And it's, it's just stipulated in the contract. It's real simple. It's all they are. They're all sort of a lead generation vehicle for us. Um, and it's just a real easy way for people who are excited about working with us to get involved at a ground level, right? This is really good for ISPs, for example, um, and other types of companies who, you know, probably aren't in the content business per se, but are interested in sort of understanding more about us and working with us and potentially deriving a revenue stream from that, right? So it's a entry level program for early stage companies or non content companies who have access to content uh, types of organizations who can actually provide us value in getting us into an account, right? Um, level three, for example, is not a, they're not a content company at all, but they work, they have connectivity and access to a lot of content originator companies. They're a good referral type of company. Just about most of the ISPs that we have right now are a good referral type of partner, okay? The next step up is a representative, right? And a representative is one who would actually can co-brand our service if they like and can take an Enron contract into an account and actually uh, work on that contract with the account and have it executed as well, right? So they are actually closing a sale for us, a representative is. And it's not like a referral where they're just giving us a lead. They're actually bringing us a customer, right? A representative has, would get paid for that, compensated as well, a little, obviously more than a referral agent would. Um, and that is actually a step up because we're giving them some co-branding. We're actually giving, we're actually expecting them to go into a customer and close a sale, right, for us. And then, you know, giving us, giving us that customer. So um, an example of a, res of a representative would be a company who, who, is, who is doing some content services, who has a sales force, who has plans of making a sales force. Maybe an ISP, for example, who has been, you know, doing this kind of stuff for a while. Um, an Exodus, for example, has data centers. They work in the content business. They could be a good example of a representative um, if they wanted to. Um, maybe an ISP who has been in the referral business, has had success at referrals, and who wants to get into resell, uh, representing our, our services more directly, can take a step up in compensation, would be a good transition for a representative. Um, but, and then, you know, they have opportunities for some co-branding. But it's somebody who has shown some interest and dedication to the business, not just says, not somebody who just says, hey, oh, by the way, this sounds cool, I want to do it. It's somebody who says, yes, I've been in the business, I'm making commitment to it, I'm forming an organization around it, and I can be a representative. Right? And then finally, the very top tier of this service is a reseller. A reseller are organizations that have established businesses and content um, in content aggregation, in website development, in, uh, in encoding, in, 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 in acquisition, um, that they've been around, they've, they've been around the block, they uh, have support organizations, and they know how to sell this. What, we, what happens there is that they can private label the service entirely themselves. Um, we sell to them at a wholesale price, and then they can mark it up at a retail price. Um, but, go ahead. Private label, would we not get any branding in that instance? Um, it, it would be private labeled. It's not, we would not necessarily get any branding. And, um, but again, that is, that is clearly the elite status of it. A, you know, RBN, for example, is a reseller. Um, Broadcast.com, if, if uh, Mark Cuban called me tomorrow and I had to give him program, they could be a reseller, you know, if we didn't see there as a conflicting with our direct sales force. But all of these people, the reseller is not for everyone. The first pitch that when, you know, we go into most accounts is definitely not, hey, let me sign you up as a reseller. It's, hey, we have, it's probably, you know, for 80% of the accounts, it's probably, hey, we have a representative or referral type of agreement that might work for you all. And if they, you know, and if we, after some due diligence, look and see that, hey, they have an organization few hundred people to support webcasting, then reseller might be the right one. Can I just make a comment? I think we should almost always start at the referral level because what happens to me now is several people who, once that reseller representative idea is thrown out, they don't want it one time. Right. right. They want that ongoing percentage. So as soon as they see that ongoing percentage, they never want to take that step back to referral. So I think we should always start at referral. And then as we go through and we find out a little more about their business, we want to make them a representative. Right. So what is the one-time 
percentage based on? It's based on the one time percent for referral is based on 10% of months three through six of the contract. Right, so it's in sense a ref it provides incentive to a referral agent to give us um, longer term contracts. And then for a representative, it's 10% for half of a term of a contract, so it's longer. Gives them a longer. And for a reseller, they, we sell at a wholesale price and they make margin on, the, on a retail price that they mark up. Okay. Um, so, as a quiz, let's see. Show Digital is an ISP, which we just signed up. Which, which program should they go into? Referral, right. Um, let's think of another one. Uh, Encoding.com has 250 people, um, has been in the business for about three years, and um, it's decided they're, they're looking at some accounts that we're not looking at. Which might be a good program for they to be in? <laughs> but yeah, it's our referral, but we'd be you know willing to look at them as a reseller. Does that make sense? Yes. Go ahead, Mark. You haven't mentioned system integrators yet. No, I haven't. And there's actually that enterprise. You know, we're talking about the organization. This enterprise group is actually we're starting to talk to systems integrators now and getting them set up as resellers of our services into an enterprise. Right, and so we've just begun that. There's a lot of issues there that we're just starting to work out with them, but we've had some initial talks. We're probably gonna pilot that in a small scale in Portland. And then representative is somewhere in between, you know? Uh, I think somebody, there are people who don't wanna be resellers, because reseller means that you take on the liability of the customer, um, uh, of the customer uh, service. Whereas representative means that we take on the liability, Enron does. So there are people who don't want to be resellers, and representative is a great program as well. Okay, so what's it going to take to actually manage these channels? Um, there's going to require a channel management and account management type of organization. Right now, that's going to fall upon the sales reps and myself and, and the media program manager to facilitate that. But account management of the channels right now, as you all know, is falling upon the sales rep's shoulders, all of our shoulders right now. Um, what needs to happen, or should happen, this is actually provisioned for in the agreements, are monthly or quarterly meetings with the accounts to define the targeted opportunities. It's actually, you know, I, I think that that can be done on an account-by-account basis. It's your decision as to what, you know, how you want to manage the accounts, either monthly or quarterly. Um, I would encourage monthly meetings at this point, especially if the accounts are accessible, meaning they're in your area. Um, either by, you know, do it by the phone, do it by email. But... Um, account management is going to be important so that we don't uh, have too much overlap. And then, you know, what at these meetings, there are going to be some accounts that um, you do not want channel partners going after, right? Because Rob and Donald are in Disney, uh, you're in Sony, right? And we've signed up webcasts.com in the area, and we don't want them touching them. And then let's say, hey, you know, I want monthly going over an account list with you. Disney and Sony are not on your list, right? And it's actually, there is provision for that in the agreement that says that, you know, the two parties will mutually agree to an account list, right? And that, and that sort of meeting should take place. Yeah, Doug. I know this is kind of discretionary, but still. Um, what happens in a case where you do have, say, a reseller that has a better relationship with a targeted, specific targeted account that you want, that you don't really want them to have, but they have a better relationship? So you really can't, it's kind of like, you know, you can't get in without them. Yeah. But at the same time, you actually, have, we, have a better, we have a better chance of facilitating the deal if we can get it. Well, I think what I would do is, I think the right thing to do is to use the reseller um, and protect the reseller. If the reseller get, brings us into the account, then, you know, we have the account. Um, it's something we can work, you know, it's, it's good enough that we can have that customer. We can talk about that. We can market that. But the reseller is an important, a hugely important part of that. And I would not try to circumvent that reseller. I would maintain that relationship with the reseller. I'll also say that, you know, we put together these programs and um, there was some, a good deal of thought around sort of the legal agreements and actually the structure of the programs, but we've not done a, a much marketing around them. We're not PR or anything like that. The website that, that, our website that just talks about the programs just launched a couple weeks ago. 
but I looked at April's deal flow list from a couple weeks ago, and about 55% of the deal flow right now is our indirect programs, right? So there is a lot of latent demand out there and partners who exist for these programs without our doing a lot of marketing. If we, you know, putting some structure around that, putting some marketing into it, I think we can really turn this into something, and something that's actually really valuable to us and are bringing to us a lot of customers. Seventy percent of their sales revenue goes through their value-added resellers and system integrators. Yeah, and, and Cisco, as a matter of fact, pays their sales reps ten percent more for indirect sales. And so, you know, this is something that we need to consider with Joe and uh, Keith and April on how we want to structure this. But we were talking about that, and I think there's an opportunity. We just need to work work more on it. Do y'all want to cover anything more on this? There's really no net loss for the company in, in selling through indirect channels. It's, it should be, in the case that, that, that you were talking about, Doug, I mean, it, there's really a, if, if it helps us get the sale and then we have to go in after the fact and try and manage the, the account directly, it, it doesn't really matter. It's still a net gain to us. Um, and it's, you know, we, we deal with the, the individual compensation issues as those come up, but uh, those, again, we, we're not, there's no penalty to any, any one person for an indirect sale. In fact, they end up getting more revenue pushed through their, their particular uh, yeah. uh, organization. So this, this is definitely, this is definitely something that we need to look at as a net gain opportunity versus uh, <coughs> having to reduce our prices because we're going through, we're giving up a piece of the action because we're going through an indirect channel. And, and the only other comment I was going to maybe you address Later. As we start moving into these e-commerce platforms and verticals, the way one vertical is handled may not be identical to the way another vertical is handled. Right. Um, so this is what we're working at right now, but it's not to say this is the way it will always be forever. If in a certain vertical, we may find there's one single partner. We're better off going in and attacking the whole market with or something to that effect. So. Yeah. I was just going to ask if we're working on materials orientation. Uh, materials. So the message that our resale partners have is consistent yes. in terms of our products and features. And yeah, we haven't. That stuff has not existed yet. Um, when uh, Lisa Hanna starts, who's responsible for media programs, she's going to kick out a lot of that stuff. And so I think we have a lot of distribution marketing going on. We have no media marketing going on. We're going to catch up, right? So that that will happen. I guarantee you. Okay. Yeah, I think Keith has a good point. Um, you can sign up one reseller and they can bring in 10 accounts, customers. There are resellers out there or representative or referral, right? There are resellers right now who have customers today, right, who will do all your work for you ostensibly if we can get them signed up. So I think it's an extraordinary opportunity. Um, and these resellers are interested in actually working with us. I've been finding because we provide, you know, a more competitive service than our competition like interview and stuff like that. It is a, a real valuable opportunity. Well, and as we mentioned yesterday, too, there's a lot of things we can't provide in that package for the customer. So we can get to a sale a lot quicker by using resellers who have to get to that package and understand our network into their package. Right. Okay. So the next thing we want to talk about is this encoding and acquisition partner uh, programs that Paul Judy, who's not here, um, put together for us. Um, so the way we sort of figured out the webcasting value chain works, and this is probably no brainer most of y'all, first obviously content must be acquired if it's a live event for example. After it's acquired it's got to be encoded, um, then hosting and archiving takes place, um, and then the managed distribution takes place, and then the end users get to see it in a high quality rich streaming media uh, point of view. Enron plays really in that middle part of the value chain. That's where our expertise is, that's what we're focusing our resources. Um, we, uh, that's what we do, that's MediaCast. We then sign up distribution partners who have eyeballs, customers, who then can you know, click on links and actually view it at the desktop in a high quality way. Um, what we want to do then are create partnerships 
with acquisition and encoding companies such that we can provide value at that and front end of the value chain as well. There are content customers um, out there who want to webcast but don't necessarily know how to acquire nor how to encode, right? And we need to provide them with a turnkey type of service. And um, we can do this um, ourselves via some platinum type of partnerships that we're putting together, right? Um, it might be that Enron Communications decides as an expertise to pull out this way and grow this as an organization. We might buy a company that does that. We might do this entirely, but today we're not. So we need to have, and our, but our customers still want that service. So we're actually putting together partnerships to do that. Um, and we have uh, acquisition types of partners and we have encoding types of partners. So the production partners that we're looking at right now are webcast solutions. I think some of y'all have been involved on calls that we've had to them. They may even become a reseller uh, because they have a pretty sophisticated business. Um, and what we're going to do ultimately is they're a specialist in acquisition and encoding services. They would provide us a special price and we could subcontract them and then provide this you know, service to customers. So we would be the interface between the customers, but for acquisition and things like that, we'd subcontract that service out to webcast solutions, right? Jump Cut is another uh, group in New York. I don't know much about them. I know you all had the first meeting with them last week or the week prior, but they could actually provide acquisition types of services for us, for Enron, um, in the New York area. Webcast Solutions is actually worldwide as well. So that's why they're an interesting partner there. Okay, and we have, we have agreements out to Webcast Solutions. Um, we're trying to close a contract with them. Hopefully that will close in the next 10 days or so. And then finally for encoding partners, um, encoding.com comes to mind as a big one. Uh, they again, they would subcontract to us, provide us with uh, discount services, and we could then provide that to our customers as well. Um, this, these partnerships can endure for a long time, if, um, assuming we want them to. If we ultimately define that we want to build this expertise in-house, we can do that as well. So a, the build versus buy decision we can extend out um, into the future. But we needed something now, and so we've developed this. You guys have any questions on that? OK. Now finally, the enterprise programs. This is sort of the more of a blue sky part of what we're going to be talking about. And it's, OK, when we're selling into the enterprise directly, how, how is it all going to work? Who's selling into the enterprise? And here's how it works, right? Um, I'm, I'm going to try not to spend too much time on this, but basically most of, most of our sales team is up here right now, um, up here and down here, is that a lot of y'all are selling to content companies and you're selling our services directly to content companies more or less. Um, we're also selling you know, to distribution partners or developing distribution partners. Um, we actually will make a sell into a, an ASP, right? Call that a video conferencing ASP or a content ASP. That content ASP will probably, or video or application, ASP is an application service provider, will likely have a, a channel of their own, either their own salespeople or an indirect channel of their own that will then begin to sell this new stuff that they've had, the e-powered stuff. Um, PictureTel is a great example of this. They have dedicated channels that know how to sell video conferencing gear into an enterprise, right? Those channels then go and sell into an enterprise, right? When that sell gets made into an enterprise, we then bring in, on this side, we bring in an e-powered ISP or an e-powered LEC into that enterprise to provide connectivity into the enterprise, right? And so. The way I'm kind of looking at things and we're developing opportunities here is that we have a selling channel up here and then we have a connectivity channel down here. And we're sort of, what we're trying to do is, and the hard part is frankly, um, creating a seamless link in between these two so that the enterprise is not calling 17 people. They're calling one person. And so um, we're trying to make that happen, but this is the model that we're developing to. Um, 
you can see we have programs in place, obviously, to support a lot of this stuff. And um, we're going to be going from there. So this is kind of the future as we get more penetration in the enterprise, as April said, as we look at particular vertical markets, this may be more, um, apply more aptly to a particular market and may, you know, apply that there is no, is no need for a indirect channel at all. But this is sort of a, our template that we're going forward with as we develop products and services for the enterprise and how to get sold in. Now, is there not a systems integration? Component? Yeah, and that's right here. I didn't talk about that. But that is, that is actually IBM Global Services who we're talking to, or Intercom who we're talking to, and having them represent our services to the enterprise. Those are the enterprise programs that we'd be putting together around here. Okay, so that's just a quick overview. Um, you know where I live, so you can <laughs> call me anytime. Donna, you have a question? Yeah, and that's so that would be uh, an acquisition partner would be a webcast solutions who can acquire. They have vans, they are access to vans, they have all the uplink stuff and all that technology that's required. Encoding.com is more of an encoding, straight on encoding company. We see them as that. We do not see them as an acquisition partner. Um, so it'd be, it'd be a company, a, an enterprise, for example, who has a lot of training content. They need to get encoded. We could subcontract that to encoding.com and bring them in as a partner there. Just, just curious, how extensive is uh, like webcast solutions capabilities geographically? Do they do stuff all over the country? They do stuff all over the world. They actually have, or in Europe, um, they actually have a presence in South Africa. Um, um, and they have some Asian facilities as well, yeah. Um, they've, uh, we've been pleasantly surprised by um, the sophistication of their organization, yeah. Enron's actually looking at an investment in them as well, so. Okay? Okay, everybody can start eating again. Thanks. Everybody hear me? It's weird. So I thought I'd tell you just a little bit about how my group is, is organized, at least for now. I know we're all kind of going through and, and re-looking at how our organizations can best support the, the new organization. So the more common, it, I have one. Is it? So I have to go up there. Oh, all right. I feel like I should break into song, but I won't, I promise. <laughs> Our objectives uh, for the, this year and into next year are, number one was to launch the company, which we started to do at NAB, and I think that was our first big entree into the marketplace, but those were for specific products to a specific audience, and we need to really go out big time in the market and let them know who we are and what we do, and uh, Claudia, who's going to be up next, will talk about the PR side of making that happen. We also want to start to generate demand. We want users to click. We want them to be viewing our products, to use our products. That's how we all make money. And we also need to cr recruit more ISPs, more distributor partners, as well as get the content folks signed up, because that's a pretty important part of our strategy. And we also want to brand ePower. ePower is our ingredient brand strategy, the thing that um, when a user sees it on a desktop, they know that that's going to be a great experience and they want to click there and it adds value. We want ISPs to be coming to us saying, I need to be e-powered. My customers want e-power, so I need to get signed up with you guys. And same on the content side. I want my content e-powered because it's going to be a better experience. I'll get more eyeballs, generate more revenue. We're also kind of working on remessaging the company, developing programs, advertising, and uh, doing some city launches. As the network gets up and running and cities are able to be e-powered, we want to go in on a city-by-city -city basis and e-power them. This is the organization as it looks today. 
Um, I report directly to Joe and Ken, the office of the chairman. Tracy McLaughlin is my new administrative assistant. She just started last week. Janet Johnson, who's in the back of the room, is a marketing communications generalist. She does a little bit of everything and is really kind of my right arm. Shaughnessy Thompson, Lamb, I'm not sure what she's going by this week, but she does graphic design. I think most of you have probably worked with her. She does great things, so if you guys need any graphic support, she's available to help out. Donna Kosorek, who I'm sure you all know, um, is the events marketing. She was the brains behind NAB and our successes there and is continuing on with many, many more events this year and next. Uh, Sini Brent is going to be moving over into kind of a, a customer event uh, position. Events like uh, at ISPCon, we're going to have a customer event there for the ISPs where we entertain them, um, really bring that relationship forward. Um, during NAB, we had an event at the Bellagio too for the content side. So events like that, she's going to help coordinate those. Sandy Thomas is uh, the uh, manager now of research and intelligence. She's getting indoctrinated right now into Houston and all of their research needs. And if you guys do have specific stuff, the companies, um, product, service offerings that you need a little bit more information on, please go ahead and give Sandy a call. And Debbie Horvath has just moved over. She was Scott Yeager's admin, and she's now um, a coordinator in the research group. We probably need to add a little testosterone to the group, and if we find a good one, they're welcome. <laughs> All right. um, well, this is some of the new messaging that we're, we're kind of baking right now. Um, Enron Communications is e-powering the global net economy. Uh, we want to build the platform from which applications run best. And I think uh, you've probably heard a little bit about this. So we're kind of still adding ingredients to that messaging. And, Claudia's working pretty hard on getting that done as well so that we can really go out to the marketplace with a, a fully baked vision, strategy, and message. <clears throat> we have, I went to Joe and to Ken and the executive team and said there were some things that we needed to do and from a, a marketing communication standpoint, branding e-power, letting the market know who we are, recruiting, and what I got the go-ahead to do was to help recruit ISPs and content people. So we're doing very specific targeted ads at those audiences. And this is the creative for the ISP ad campaign. And it's probably hard to see, and I do have boards that are going around that you can take a look at. But kind of the whole premise is that ISPs have one flavor right now. And we can help them grow their business, add additional things to their products and services. So by coming e-powered, you turn into TJ's World Juices instead of the lemonade stand. This is the content provider ad campaign. Both of them will be a series of three. So these are just the first ones. Um, they're still in development stage, so these aren't the finals. But the analogy here is that content providers are holding back the good stuff because they can't be insured of a good delivery at the desktop. So we're saying, you know, unleash the premium stuff, open the floodgates to great content because we can deliver it in a quality way. And as we go into cities and, and e-power them, we're looking at some, some branding campaigns as well. Um, there was a series of three that we looked at and this one kind of shows a lot of power. Get ready, it's coming, buckle up, it's going to be exciting. So you can see the, kind of the race car analogy. Q4, we've got some media placements planned. I know this, too, is going to be hard to read. Like I said, we're targeting the ISP audience and the content provider. For the ISPs, we'll be in BoardWatch, Interactive Week, uh, Internet World, Tele.com, and the Internet Industry Directory. For the content provider ads, we'll be in Business 2.0, Fast Company, Industry Standard, Red Herring, Broadcasting and Cable, Electronic Media, TV Technology. And then we're also working right now on getting our online strategy so that we can start placing ads on the online sites for these uh, publications and others as well. For the online strategy, we really want to look, we don't want to do banner ads. They, they don't have a real positive response. You get single digit click through rates. So we're looking at more of an educational experience 
where you can go in and learn about a topic where we would post a white paper. And that seems to be getting a real positive response. People, you get into the you know, 20 to 25 percent success rate. And also look at some uh, rich media banners as well that are a little bit more interesting and intriguing for people. Enron Corp, as you know, has made us core to their business and they're going to be launching um, a series of brand campaigns to reposition Enron as not an energy company anymore. Um, they're working with Ogilvy Mather, an agency out of New York, and they're going to be doing a series of, of TV ads starting probably in the November time frame. There'll be five ads and they're all centered around the premise of why. Enron questioning why. Why do things have to be done the way they've always been done? And they're pretty neat. We've seen the storyboards. And two of those ads will specifically be about us. One will be on the bandwidth trading, um, questioning why. Why do I have to have bandwidth at night when I'm not using it kind of thing. And then we're also going to work with them on doing an e-commerce placement. So pretty exciting. They're, they're committing um, 10 to $15 million a year to run this for the next three years. So I think we're, we're going to get a lot of leverage out of that as well. And it'll be primarily TV, very little print, maybe some outdoor stuff, but uh, primarily TV, looking at you know, the CNBCs, CNN, FN, really targeting that business audience, which is who we're looking at as well. Some of the things we did in 1999, we really accomplished a lot with very few resources, particularly those of the human nature. Um, I think a lot of you were at NAB, huge success for us. Um, we did um, solo exhibits at a broadband conference here a couple months ago. We've been in a lot of, um, of our partner pavilions with Real, Cisco, Sun. We've got a lot of other things coming up for this quarter, next quarter, and then a lot of stuff with international expansion in the year 2000. And I, I get a lot of requests from folks. They see shows. They think they're good for us to be at, and we're happy to take a look at those. We can't exhibit at every one, but it certainly doesn't mean that folks can't attend. Maybe we can sponsor a luncheon rather than having a big exhibit, because it does take a lot of time and planning, and it also takes a lot of people's time in staffing those booths, and we just don't have enough to go around, particularly um, technical folks. September 15th, we're going to be launching the new look and feel of the website, along with corporate. They're giving us a lot more latitude to be more creative, um, be a little bit more interactive with our folks that are coming to our site. And this is just kind of a, a little overview of what it's going to look like. So we're pretty excited about that. Ours looks pretty much like an energy company right now. City launches, I think I touched on briefly, um, trying to work real closely with um, the, the technical side of the house, making sure that cities that we go into are ready to be e-powered. We don't want to go into a city, you know, when people say it's up, that, that there's a lot of different meanings to that. Is it really ready to be e-powered? Can customers actually get it? If we go in and tell them that they want it, can they go find it? Does it work? So we're working real closely with um, the provisioning side to make sure that everything is ready to go as we go in and, and launch. So I think it's an exciting time. I've, I've been here since the very beginning, and it just gets better all the time. I'm really excited about what the future holds for all of us. Anybody have any questions? Any marketing uh, or anything, any attention from the uh, like DW48 type products or dark fiber? Is there any concept of having awareness for those types of services? I brought that up. I was at the agency on um, Friday, and I brought up that specifically. And we talked about certain publications and going back and pitching both editorial which would be done through Claudia staff, and then there's also what's called an advertorial, which is kind of a paid for editorial, where we can develop the content for the article, and they will uh, place it in their publication. So we can really educate the market on what Windows is. I don't think it's a, um, a concept that everybody's really familiar with, so I think more of an editorial, advertorial strategy is where we want to go. So I've identified the publications, um, I think uh, Jennifer, drop some off on Janet's desk that we want to go after for editorial and advertorial placement. How, just out of curiosity, how expensive, like for example, Pointcast, I mean, pretty much in the telecom world, most telecom people watch Pointcast. Um, is it expensive to 
the advertising that deal I'm looking at right now. We can watch the <laughs> thing go through. They all really vary. It depends on what you want to put there, if it's just a regular banner ad or if it's something a little bit more. Um, the frequency in which you're willing to purchase space. If you're willing to have something up there for a year, you can get a good rate you know, on a monthly basis, but it's still going to be quite a bit of money. So they, they all really vary. Um, most of the, the publications will start in the October books. Corporate, TV apps, right? right, the corporate stuff is, is slated to start in November, is what they've told us, but they haven't even started shooting yet, so I, I'm going to not promise November for sure. Are these going to be prime, prime time ads? Yeah. Game, like, say, uh, doing football games, stuff like that, where you get the most. <coughs> They're not really looking at the football games. Those are pretty expensive placements. They're really focusing on business, um, like I said, the, the CNNs the CNBCs, maybe even the Discovery Channel, some of those types where folks like you and I are, are typically watching TV. So I wouldn't look for a Super Bowl ad anytime soon. <laughs> that kind of eats up the budget. <laughs> I doubt it. They have Enron Field now in Houston. But <laughs> yeah, a, a while ago they did sponsor some stuff on PBS. I most certainly will. Well, thank you very much. And I just want to take a real quick second too to um, thank Linda DeHaan for all of the effort that she's put into this. Um, I think she's done a great job. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I thought dinner was pretty fun last night. Yeah. It's nice to be entertained while you eat. Yeah. So great job. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so